Chris Newman with a little story, just a little story about tribal entrepreneurship in the 1820s New Zealand. I'm just going to skim the top of the story because it contains a whole range of characters and situations and elements. So I'm going to attempt to give it a good, a good overview for you and a little run through a few um, aspects where the entrepreneurship and the uh, tikanga, the tribal law, interweave and make the story even more fascinating. So we've got the entrepreneur is the Ngāpui chief Hongi Hika, and another entrepreneur is a, a Baron de Terry, who was a, an Englishman with pretensions to nobility, who was looking for land or an estate or a place where he could preside as a baron, and meeting by chance Hongi Hika, who had travelled to London, travelled to England, and was a social society uh, phenomenon, like a rock star with his tattooed head and his beautiful uh, cut suit going around the salons and the soirees of England, uh, accompanied by Thomas Kendall, his missionary friend, and by the other chief Waikato. So there was two fascinating uh, rock star Maori chiefs cruising London at that time. They met with King George the Fourth, and were uh, totally inspired by the King's military prowess, which fed into Hongi Hika's purpose for his visit to Britain, which was to secure arms suitable for his purposes. Arms meaning the uh, British uh, muzzle-loading musket known as Brown Bess. So in, at, at by, by a, a happen chance, they met Baron de Terry in Cambridge. Uh, this is around 1820-21. And there was a deal struck. And the fascinating deal was that uh, Hongi Hika offered Baron de Terry 40,000 acres on the Hokianga in exchange for 500 brand new muskets made at the armourer's factory in around London or somewhere like that. And uh, there were, of course there had to be gunpowder and shot to make these things go. And these arms were to be paid for by Baron de Terry in exchange for this estate or so the Baron thought, and so Hongi Hika promised. And the deal was struck, and Thomas Kendall brokered it. Now, it's quite unusual in this um, outcome because the, <laughs> the muskets were manufactured and they were smuggled somehow to Sydney undercover. And on his return to New Zealand, Hongi Hika picked the muskets up around 1821, around that time, and brought 500 muskets, plus oh, we think there was more because he, he went to cash converters there or whatever and traded in some of his uh, gifts and other goods he had uh, received in, in, in Britain from admirers to buy yet more muskets. So he certainly was a heavily armed fellow by the time he came back home which raised his stakes tremendously with his tribesmen who were the Napui in the north. Now, <clears throat> he uh, armed his warriors and then they, in essence, I'm simplifying this, but they initiated the musket wars, which plunged New Zealand into this arms race, which went for 20 years, killed about 30 to 40,000 of uh, other tribes, and a lot of them were eaten, of course, by the warriors because... As they ran their campaigns, they needed a food supply and the larder was either the slaves who were with them or the, 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 the Maori pa or settlement in front, which they were about to uh, ransack and destroy and have their way with everybody. And those left over were, became slaves. Now, what's interesting about this story is Hongi Hika has this tapu, he has this holy story, this holy mission this great purpose of going to London to meet the king. And he, he and the king greet each other, and we understand the king said, Hello, Mr. Hongi, Mr. King. And Hongi Hika said to the king, Hello, Mr. King. So they, they were just exchanging pleasantries. But the, the holy story is also in the deal, 
And Baron de Terry was sucked into this idea that he would be part of this wonderful uh, world in New Zealand. Now, the deal was also about plunder, because obviously uh, Hongihika had no real intention of delivering on the 40,000 acres, but he was going to plunder Baron de Terry for his money, because Baron de Terry pay, play, paid for the muskets, but he couldn't satisfy all the bill. And as we understand, he spent some period in debtor's prison. However, the muskets were well on their way to New Zealand by that time. Now, Hongiheka uh, subsequently was wounded and eventually died from a musket wound. However, Baron de Terry finally made it to New Zealand around 1835. Um, he came via Sydney, but there was no land. Hika had died and he was bereft. Now, a few kind chiefs in the Hokianga gave him, I think, 300 acres that he could kind of live on. And his whole uh, vision of building a, a sort of a, a baronessy or a noble, noble estate here faded like a, like, a, like a punctured balloon down to very much uh, nothing. And I believe that Baron de Terry ended his uh, years teaching music, piano lessons in Auckland. So the key thing here is we see the running of tapu, muru, utu and mana. We see how all those elements of the tikanga play through the story and were driving this hongihika who many people assume was a very um, uh, noble savage when in fact he was a savage noble. Very different understanding. He was a savage noble, but he was treated as a noble savage in, in London and in high society. Uh, very interesting because there were portraits made of him and he was a bit of a, you know, like a rock star, I said, a, you know, a man about town, a celebrity, uh, for the period about five months when he was there. Of course, he got tired of being um, fated in London and was only too happy to get home and to commence his bloody campaign against tribes who he imagined had harmed his ancestors or there were occasionally um, uh, other historic events where there had been um, uh, Utu against his people and so he was about to pay it back. But this story is amplified by the fact that he could access new technology and the problem is not the technology and to say it's white man's guns is a load of nonsense. It was Hongi Hika's incredible desire for revenge in Utu, which drove this whole campaign. And the fact that historically it was the time when there were muskets available is, is just neither here nor there. It was his drive. After all, the, uh, the Europeans were not running around with muskets, shooting all the Maoris and running around eating them and killing them for revenge. Nothing like that. So it was his drive uh, using the tikanga and his, of course, tribal entrepreneurship, that's at the bottom of the story, and I thought you might like to hear that, because it shows another angle on this so-called land claim business. What happened to those 40,000 acres? Well, they didn't exist in any sense. I mean, the land existed, but Hongiheka had absolutely no, no intention, obviously, of transferring that land. And as things worked, worked out, the whole thing became an exercise in plunder. Uh, Utu, Mana and Tapu all fully manifested in our tribal entrepreneurship in the 1820s. Uh, I hope that gives you something to think about. There are many, many stories like this which tend to round off our view of history. Thank you.